the years following the American Revolution, the United States was in spiritual turmoil. Before the Revolution, 40% or more of people went to church. After the Revolution, the 1790s, 5 to 10% of the people who lived in the United States attended church regularly. The nation was consumed with sin. Women were afraid to go out at night. Men were involved in all kinds of things that were not godly things. If you polled the students at the universities of that day, you would discover a terrible thing. They did poll them. They discovered at Harvard there were zero students who uh, said they believed in Jesus as Lord. They polled the students at Princeton. They got two. They polled the students at Yale, and they got five. That's the east. That's the eastern part of the country. In the frontiers, a little further west, things are not even better. The nation was expanding slowly out to the western areas, and it was a frontier. It was a scary place, and there were few and far between when it came to churches. The frontier was a spiritual wasteland, just like the east was. But some people began to pray. A man in New England called the people to pray, and they did. And revival began to spread around the country. Revival began to break out in the universities. Yale got a new president. He was a believer in Jesus. And he, he, the students asked him to debate, debate about Jesus. You see, there weren't any believers on campus, or not a lot of them. And so he did. He debated them. And he began to speak about Jesus. He began to teach about Jesus. He began to uh, talk to the students about that. And revival broke out on that campus. Revival began to spread to other campuses. Revival began to spread around the country. And the United States experienced a great awakening. Prayer is essential to experiencing what God wants to do. Prayer is essential to revival. And that prayer is based on God's word. And today we're going to look at what happens when you literally rediscover God's word. So let's dive in. Let's look at what's going on in the nation of Judah at this time. To do that, we need to look at some numbers. First, we need to see that the year that we're talking about is around 640 BC. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us, but it can remind us that the temple in Jerusalem is now about 320 years old. The renovations that we talked about prior with Joash happened 215 years prior to this. The reforms we talked about last week with Hezekiah took place almost a century before this. And you see, after Hezekiah's rule, there were a few kings in Judah. One of them was a man named Manasseh. Manasseh was a terrible leader. He was an ungodly leader. And the, the time that we're about to speak about, when King Josiah comes to power, was a time much like the American, the American country right after the Revolution. And there was a, a time of spiritual decay, a turmoil. And I think it can be said of that time, like it was said of the time that we spoke about after the Revolution, that there are literally thousands of people who've never heard one chapter of the Bible read to them. They've never looked at the pages of Scripture and read the words of Jesus. That's the time that Josiah comes to power. Hundreds of years after Solomon, but after a reign of a terrible king, where the word of God was disregarded and literally lost. Let's look and let's see what happens in the words of Scripture. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, according to all the law of Moses. And no one like him arose after him. And that's speaking of King Josiah. King Josiah who comes to power after some terrible men. You would think he would walk in their shoes. But we see from this description that King Josiah was like no other king. He followed after the Lord. And why did he do that? It's because he found a book. Look with me at 2 Kings. The high priest Hilkiah told the court secretary Shaphan, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. And he gave the book to Shaphan, who read it. Then the court secretary Shaphan went to the king and reported, Your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the temple and have given it to those doing the work those who oversaw the, king, the Lord's temple. Then the Lord's secretary, Shaphan, told the king, The high priest, Hilkiah, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. Now, Josiah becomes king at age 8. At age 16, he commits himself to following the Lord. At age 20, he begins to tear down all the idols on the high places in the nation. 
At age 26, he begins to repair the temple. And in that process, these men discover a book, the book of the law. I want us to take a moment before we get to that book, and I want us to consider the people involved in this process. The people involved in the spiritual reforms that Josiah is participating in. You see, uh, we have Shaphan who read the book. We have Hilkiah who found the book. There's also other people, some unnamed people in this passage that we know about from Scripture and from history. And those people include Huldah, Jeremiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. In other words, this time in Israel's history was a glittering moment before tragedy. This was a time where people were doing their part. Other people were doing their part. Some people wrote books. Some people are remembered in Scripture. Some people are celebrated in Scripture. And some people just quietly do their work and are mentioned in passing in Scripture. Why is it important to remember that spiritual leaders do not act alone? And how can we as individuals play a role in the spiritual renewal of our community and nation? You see, each person in this account plays a role. Some of them found the book. Some of them provide spiritual counsel, as we're going to see. Somebody interprets the text and helps him understand what's going on. We all play our little part in God's grand story. And all of our parts, some may be remembered, some may not, some may be tiny, some may be huge. But they all play a specific part. We need to find our part. But in this, also in the story, we can see not just that people play a part, but there's a spiritual problem in this nation. What does it say about the book? It says they found the book. Y'all, if they find something, that means they've lost something. They've lost God's word. Literally, they lost the Bible. And no one had it. No one knew what it said. Now, we don't know exactly what this book was. It could have been just the book of Deuteronomy. It could, have book, it could have been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We don't really know. Scholars disagree. But what's clear is that the people in Josiah's day didn't know what God was saying because they didn't have God's Word. We need to remember that studying God's Word is key to knowing what God wants us to do. So they find the book, and they go. They take the book to the king, and they report on the situation. Yeah, yeah. Things are going along good. We paid the guys. Everything's good. And hey, I found this book. Now, Shaphan had already read the book. We didn't know really what he thought, but he thought it was important enough to take it to the king. So he takes it to the king, and the king says, well, read the book to me. Now, if it was just Deuteronomy, uh, scholars tell us it would take about three hours to read this to him, read aloud to him the book of Deuteronomy. I think it would take me a little longer than that, but, you know. And then it says that if it was the entire Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It would take all day. Again, I think it would take me longer, but that's what they say. But he read the book to him. And Josiah the king, he, he sat there on his throne. He listened. Listened to what the word of God said. Let's look and let's see how he responded to what God said. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then he commanded the priest to Ochiah, Iakam, son of Shaphan, Akbar, son of Micah, the court secretary Shaphan, and the king's servant Isaiah, go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all of Judah about the words in this book that has been found. For great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of this book in order to do everything written about us. I think we need to see here several things. But first, we need to see that the king responded with grief and remorse. He tore his clothes as a sign of grief and remorse. Why? Because he understood something. He understood the words in this book, which we haven't had, are vital to our nation. The words in that book are vital to you and me. So the king responded with grief because he hadn't heard these words. I want you to take a moment. I want you to consider something. Why is it important to read the Bible? And what happens to a believer if he or she, quote, loses the book of God?
the Bible is vital to our spiritual health. If we don't have scripture, we don't know what God has for us to do. If we don't have scripture, we don't know what God wants of us. If we don't have scripture, we don't, we don't know how to respond to life's crisis. If we don't have scripture, we don't respond to God to, to God to life's joys. If we don't have scripture, we don't know how to live life. And the king, when he heard God's words, he responded in grief. He responded in remorse because he didn't have it. Do you respond to remorse when you don't have God's word? You see, God's word had literally been lost in God's temple, and nobody cared. So the king got word that he had the word, and the king listened to the word, and the king responded to the word. He responded in grief, and then he responded by seeking counsel. He began to seek out people to help him understand what the word was all about. And then he sent these men to find somebody to tell him more. What's all this for? What's all this about? As we do the same thing, we need to consider how can we go about determining who might be a good sounding board for us as we read and try and understand God's Word. King Josiah is hearing something probably for the first time, and he doesn't quite get it. He doesn't quite understand what the book is saying. So he says, guys, come help me figure this out. He sought out spiritual counselors. Y'all, we do the same thing. I don't, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'll read the Bible and I'm like, what is that talking about? What's going on here? You see, when I come upon those things, I go to trusted sources. Yes, I go to books, because that's the kind of person I am. I go and I pick up a commentary. I pick up a study Bible. I look and I see what it means. Sometimes I go to people I trust. I go to my pastor. I go to uh, older people who study the word a lot longer than I have, and I say, what does this mean? What is this talking about? You see, as we study the Bible, we're going to have questions, and we're going to need to ask people those questions, but we need to ask the right people. We need to ask people who actually know what the Bible says. People who actually have the Holy Spirit. People who actually listen to the Lord. So that's what Josiah did. He said, I don't understand this. I have this group of people I trust. Y'all need you to go figure this out. And they do. They go to someone, they say, you help us figure this out. This is new to us too. We, we hadn't had this in a long time. Tell us what it means. So let's see what happens. So these guys that the king had chosen went to the prophetess Huldah. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. They spoke with her. She said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Say to the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the works of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. Say this to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. As for the words that you heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your ancestors, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I am bringing on this place. Then they reported to the king. So the king sought counsel. He got someone to help him figure out what's going on. And they go to this prophetess. And she is one of only four female prophets mentioned in the Old Testament. We don't know anything about her. We know kind of who her kinfolks are. We know where she lives. We don't know, don't know a whole lot more about her. But she must have been super respected for the king to seek her out first. There are other prophets in the land. But he goes to this person. This person he trusts and he says, this is important. I don't understand. Help me figure it out. So what's the first thing she tells them? She tells him about judgment. She tells him that judgment is coming. You see, when someone comes to us and tries to understand Scripture, maybe for the first time, maybe they've never read Scripture before, maybe they've never heard about Jesus before, and they begin to learn about him. First thing, the most important thing, 
is not all the crazy theology uh, stuff that you might read in a book. It's not about maybe the end times. It's not about all the sciencey questions we have today. The important thing that they must learn first is that God will judge sin. Judgment is coming. Judgment is what Scripture says will happen to those who sin. But then what else happens? She tells them about God's grace. Because of his listening, because of his grief, because of his remorse, God's going to uh, demonstrate his grace on him. Now, the situation in the text is a little different from our lives today. My response to God has no effect on your response to God. But in our life today, we take someone and we say, we are all sinners. We are all sinners. Me, you, everybody. We've done bad things. And because of that, we deserve judgment. We deserve to spend time, eternity, away, out of God's presence. And guess what? There's grace. God offers us grace. Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life, died on a cross in my place, taking responsibility for mine and your sins, rose from the grave three days later, appeared to many, and wants to be in charge of my life and forgive me of my sins. You see, there is judgment because of sin, but there is grace in Jesus. And that's what Huldah is pointing to way in the future. Now, she's talking about Jerusalem, but, but her words point us to Jesus' grace. They point us to the truth that we can experience that in our lives. But, you know, I think, think on this. Think about Josiah. Someone brought him the book. Someone explained the book to him. And in that explanation, he discovered God's judgment and God's grace. We need to help people find God's book. Y'all, the book is lost in America. It might be the number one best-selling book in the world. I don't know. But America has lost the word of God. Your community has lost the word of God. Meaning your family have forgotten and lost the word of God. Maybe they've never picked it up in their life. We need to help them find it. We need to help them find the word of God. Help them understand what it means. Help them see God's grace in that book. You can help people do that. You can invite people to join you in small group. You can invite people to read the Bible with you. You can go and help someone understand what the Bible means. I want to challenge you this week. Rediscover the book for yourself. Experience it in a new, fresh way. And then take it to somebody this week. I, I'm going to challenge you with that. Actually, literally, get a Bible. If you need one, contact me. We've got plenty. Get a Bible and literally take it to someone this week. Take it to someone and say, read this. Discover God's grace. Invite them to join you in church. Invite them to join you in small group. That's our challenge this week. That's what we see from Josiah. When we discover the book, everything changes. When we, take, when we become part of those who interpret the book and take it to others, everything changes. Be a change maker. Be someone who wants to change your community and participate in that. I'll see you next week.